Good afternoon. I'm Renee Vander Avor, the Assistant Curator of Canadian Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Welcome to our Art in the Spotlight series of talks. And I am so pleased today to be speaking with Shelley Zhang. Um, so we are joining you in virtual space today, but I would like to acknowledge that the AGO operates on Anishinaabe territory, which has been shared with the Haudenosaunee and Wendat, and has been a gathering place for Indigenous people since time immemorial. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to share and peaceably care for the, the land and resources around the Great Lakes. Values of care and mutual respect are at the core of the Indigenous, Indigenous and Canadian Department, uh, which is the depart department in which I work at the AGO, and I am deeply grateful to benefit from my place um, on this land. I would also, before we, be we begin, like to say thank you to TD and the Ready Commitment, who are our lead sponsor of talks and performances, for their generous support of this talk. So um, welcome, Shelley. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to begin uh, by reading your bio. So Shelley is a Beijing-born multidisciplinary artist based in Toronto. By uniting both past and present iconography with the techniques of mass communication, language, and sign, Zhang's work deconstructs notion of tradition, gender, and the diaspora, as well as popular culture while calling attention to these subjects in the context of and construction of a multicultural society. She has exhibited at venues including Work Jam Beijing, Asian Art Initiative Philadelphia, and Gallery 44 in Toronto. She is a recipient of grants from the Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council, and the Canada Council, and is a member of Amelia Amalia, a feminist working group. In 2017, Shelley was an artist in residence at the AGO. Recent and upcoming projects include exhibitions at Art Space in Peterborough, the Tell Brown Gallery in Toronto, AKA Artist Run Center in Saskatoon, and the Anchorage Museum in Alaska. So Shelley, I recently saw some of your work on view at the Tell Brown Gallery, which is in the West End of Toronto. Um, and I was quite taken with it. I think you're, um, your work is just fantastic. Um, so the, the work I saw at Patel Brown, um, I believe was work from two series, Cornucopias from 2019-2020 and Offerings to Both Past and Future from 2018-2019. And in these works, you're presenting different types of fruit in really beautiful arrangements that um, seem, to be, seem to be very intentionally staged. The fruit is almost jewel-like and presented on different types of pedestals um, that bring, fo bring forth ideas of care and affection and labor. So I'm wondering if you would like to begin by telling us how you began this series and how it came to be. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks Renee for that lovely introduction. It's always nice to hear folks' thoughts on, on projects and how they came to them. Um, so the the two series that you're referencing are, are from a sort of exhibition that was shown first at Artspace in um, Peterborough uh, called Abundance. And so the focus point of these two shows is largely around fruit, but using fruit and vegetables in display forms as a, as a different kind of metaphor. Um, so thinking about how they're used symbolically, thinking about how they circulate, think, thinking about how they're cultivated and grown as well. Um, and maybe I'll start first by just giving a visual to what that actually looks like. So these are three, three works from the series basically. And so I came to be really interested in fruit after some other projects that I've done in the past around food, but also how food circulates within various communities. And so although largely I don't consider myself as an artist who's like interested in food as a, as a, as a visceral form, um, I am curious into what they come to stand for in our domestic spaces and our homes and sort of how they're circulated a bit. And so the, the impetus for this series came um, after a trip back to Beijing about two, three years ago now, where um, 
fruit was just circulated in a different environment there. You know, it was, uh, it was my grandmother's 80th birthday that year. And so throughout the entire day, people were bringing vast baskets of fruit to her doorstep. Um, and simultaneously, it was also, you know, um, the first time I went back to Beijing after my grandfather passed. And so what we would did on one evening when we visited his, uh, his grave is we, we came and together and bought lots of fruit together to sort of um, um, prepare for the day to visit him and pay tribute to him essentially. And so that's kind of where this series came to, came to fruition is thinking about how um, in, in my early days, fruit would be an extension of a, a gesture basically. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a gesture that sort of does not need a lot of words where it's sort of like, this is a gift, please eat it, nourish it, uh, use it to nourish your body and then um, you know, accept the, the sort of love that comes with it. Um, and so the series came from thinking about that a little bit cyclically from when I was a child and how that would sort of be given to me by familiar uh, members of my family. And then simultaneously this um, circular notion of like putting together these arrangements with the purpose of um, celebrating my ancestors and my ancestors and my family. Um, but throughout this process, I also got to know a little bit more about um, how these things are where they're grown and where they're circulated a bit. Um, so not, not thinking of my family as just people in my family, but also thinking of different forms of prior relations and legacies that I benefit from essentially. Um, so there's one example that I quite like to use where for instance, um, uh, cherries and specifically Bing cherries are this uh, fruit that came to be cultivated in like the late 19th century by an early Chinese settler named Ah Bing. And so he, he changed the, the cherry to a strain that used to be like the Republican cherry to the Bing cherry. And what's really interesting about his life story is he went back to China in like 18 something something and then right afterwards, the, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act in America came to fruition. So he wasn't able to, to come back. And so I think about these stories where, you know, people have sort of left an imprint um, within the legacy of like fruit as a symbol, almost. Um, some of it is also has to do with, uh, you know, trying to, trying to make moments where I can take pause and reflect on more personal ways in terms of, um, creating traditions essentially. So although I think uh, I don't identify as a highly spiritual person in the traditional sense, um, I would like to create more rituals and more moments of pause where I can um, acknowledge these histories and how they, they came to fruition basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of the series. Um, I, what I love about your work is that um, all of your projects seem to mine these complex and very nuanced histories um, that are often kind of hiding below the surface of objects. Um, so it's super interesting to hear you speak about these um, specific histories of fruits like the Bing cherry. Um, and I, I also, um, I like that idea of how food can be tied to memory or collective memory and kind of forging new ways forward in creating traditions. Um, I wanted to ask you um, if you might just go back to the previous slide, the image in the center, um, the idea of care and labor really comes through to me in that one because of the way these fruits have been peeled so carefully and expertly. Um, and I, I know you mentioned there's also a personal aspect obviously to these works. So I was wondering if you could speak about um, why those fruits have been peeled and also is there significance to the, the bowl that they're in. Yeah, for sure. So this one is actually the first one that was created in the in the series. And so the bowl that it's in is, um, is from a set of two that I have that was actually that used to be my grandfather's and that I sort of inherited in the process. Um, and he was kind of a, he was a big hoarder and collector like, like me, it's possibly it's where I sort of get it from a little bit. Um, but bringing sort of objects, fragile objects like this over back into Canada was kind of a, a nightmare of a process a little bit in terms of how to get it here properly. 
And so um, I was committed to making sure these were not going to break in the process of them arriving here, basically. Um, and that sort of added trauma of passing between borders, if you will. And so while I was bringing them back into Canada to avoid, you know, declaring them or anything, I basically strapped them to my body and with padding and then crossed airport security like, like that. Um, and so they were able to sort of stay with me the entire trip. And so what I, what I remember really fondly about my grandfather is that um, he, he was a man of few words, though a very caring and wonderful individual. And so often um, he would just hand me a peeled fruit just quietly and walk away. Um, and so this was kind of a, a little bit about that, um, the idea of just making it a little easier, if you will, to make it digestible in your favor, um, whether it's sort of cutting pieces up or making them um, more quickly to be eaten, I suppose. So this one's for, this one's for him. Such a lovely gesture. Um, the image on the left is um, still life with nectarines and peaches, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I think that some of the fruit in this image are real and some of them are fake. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on, on that, your use of artificial fruit and that kind of dichotomy there. I started became interested in artificial depictions of fruit when um, I came across this article a while ago in some interior design magazine. And it was it was talking about the history of um, fake fruit and how they came to be in terms of like domestic decor, basically. Um, so how you would see like, uh, sort of like, oops, uh, sort of like things like this in, a, in the different series, but it would be plastic pieces of fruit in a bowl you know, possibly at a relative's home, possibly in a restaurant's space. Um, and oftentimes they would be kind of um, displays of fruit that were almost very hard to come by to piece together, like to have a fruit from all these different categories a little bit. Um, and what this interior design article sort of said is it talked about how this trend of plastic fruit faded away eventually. Um, and it was because of a movement where plastic fruit is seen as like artificial and fake. And so it, the movement towards real fruit was more of a, a, a quote unquote genuine approach to um, that display, if you will. You know, it's actually something you might eat as opposed to something that just sits there and collects dust forever. And so I thought that was really interesting because um, I don't necessarily see groupings of plastic fruit as a, as a disingenuous act if you will. And in a way I read them as a, a longing for something that's not easily available. Um, there's a, a wonderful mentor of mine. She told me this story once where um, when she was growing up in Toronto years and years ago as a, within a Chinese family, how for um, a holiday season, each of them would get like one lychee. Um, and that was sort of the, the you know, treat for the season, if you will. And it was because these fruits were so hard to come by in distribution back then. And of course now they're um, much more readily available for a myriad of factors. Um, and so going back to this, this um, uh, nectarine and peach work on the left, I started to look around my home a little bit and think of all these little, um, almost like totems to this that I was able to find. Um, so the, there's some real fruit in there and then there's some fake ones for sure. Uh, there's, let me see, there's a, a marble peach that a friend of mine gave me. Um, there's a peach lip balm container that actually just looks so, so delicate and so similar. Um, and then on the very left, actually that's a sculpture by another artist named um, uh, Mizba, who I purchased that work from that um, I just fell in love with. It's so gorgeous. So. Um, it's sort of a combination of fake and real things that I find in my home, which I believe are equally significant, if you will, though in different appearances. Yeah. Um, I think by, by bringing in artificial fruit, um, you're obviously adding a lot of other layers to the conversation. Um, and one of them, and maybe this is because I know um, I've been following your work for some time and I know you've 
dealt with um, ideas of exchange and um, cultural appropriation um, and kind of different translations of objects in international contexts. Um, but to me that the artificial fruit is something that can be, you know, very cheaply acquired and is mass produced um, and brings to mind notions of, I guess, kitsch or, um, you know, overconsumption, um, just the material of plastic itself, I think carries those, those ideas. Um, so I'm wondering if you'd like to speak about those kind of larger ideas of exchange and cultural exchange that come through in your practice. Yeah, I think, um, so kind of what I mentioned before where, um, speaking to that story that my mentor, a mentor of mine shared with me where um, a lot of these things weren't readily available because the population was smaller or because um, there wasn't the industry to sort of bring them over in that way. Um, I think it's kind of interesting how now we're, we're quote unquote in this um, phase of abundance, if you will, where because of globalization, because of the internet, um, so many things are available at our fingertips a little bit. Um, even the, the sort of plastic fruit that I was able to get for this body of work were largely you know, easily accessible from like restaurant supply shops or thrift stores um, or yeah, other places like like that where you can sort of find them um, available. And so I'm kind of interested in this concept of like stand-ins for um, what we can't always have access to, if you will. And so it's partially why a lot of these images are hype, shot hyper, almost sort of in the language of commercials um, or commercial photography, I should say is um, instead of utilizing that language to sort of quote unquote sell something in a, in a commerce sense. Um, what can we do if we sort of pause and reflect on these symbols and how they're circulating, what they sort of stand for symbolically, metaphorically, personally, um, and then, uh, but also kind of like how these things come to us, you know? Like I think of um, um, migrant workers who, you know, right now it's quite timely in terms of um, their folks who pick our fruit that we eat every day and still don't have the same rights that many of us where citizens do, for instance, or um, a lot of fruit sort of has highly colonial roots in terms of how they were cultivated as well. Um, and so sort of like, how did we get to this phase of abundance and what is also um, left out of the equation in that process? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I when I look at your work, I think a lot about labor, and um, kind of the idea of labor that happens so far away that is becomes detached and then becomes invisible. Um, so these acts of labor are then, in a sense, devalued and forgotten about. Um, but I think your work kind of reminds viewers about about those, um, you know, those important players who are involved with bringing these things um, to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the different backgrounds and the wallpapers that you're using. Um, I know you, you said the word domestic and some of them do to me have a sort of a domestic feel where some of, the, some of them are a bit more like stately. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious about the backgrounds. Yeah, so they're, they're very intended to be reminiscent of like wallpapers. And um, this is definitely a body of work that is meant to sort of sit at home on people's countertops, on people's tablecloths, um, against wall backdrops, if you will. And so normally when I sort of display these works, they're in a, a sort of frame that's kind of enveloping where the background extends to the frame as well. And so I'm interested in sort of emphasizing the objectness of the thing, if you will. So it's, it's not just an image, but it's a, it's a thing. Um, that sort of extends to that. And I take a lot of photographs of, of compilations of things that I collect or are sort of found objects. Um, and in a way it's part of it's sort of like a reading of a portrait to me um, where even though it's things, it's like, who are the people behind these things, if you will. Um, the, the piece in the center here is a, is a grouping of bitter melons and so um, whenever I look at this, I think of um, 
when I used to live in little Portugal in Toronto and how a lot of home gardens would grow these these melons because um, the white ones, for instance, were harder to find in grocery stores. And so um, I think home gardens are kind of a really revolutionary way to um, grow the food that you want to eat and um, basically use it for yourself and your network, you know, in a way um, without having to go through main channels. Um, and so I think of the, the home gardeners who sort of do that in this sort of portrait. Uh, yeah. And I, I also use um, photos with, uh, let me think, with the backdrops extended in the back to almost sort of emphasize the point that these are meant to be situated in a home and there. They might be things that are in the viewer's home as well in terms of things that they surround yourself with. Um, so not only to emphasize the subjects in the photo, but also like looking within our own domestic spaces a bit more perhaps. Yeah, they, they feel somewhat familiar. Um, can we look at the cornucopia works? So these are actual, these are actual sculptural objects um, in mm -hmm. the gallery space. And um, I, the word cornucopia is, um, is kind of a, a funny word. I, I mean, it's a symbol of plenty and there's almost this like mythological side of it with that like goat's horn with all of the food flowing out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it obviously it makes me think about a harvest and again the labor that is involved with that. Um, but it, it also is like this horn of plenty and then it, it reminds me of overconsumption again and um, mm -hmm. the kind of greed that comes along with Thanksgiving. Um, so that's sort of where where my mind goes um, when I consider the title of the series. Um, I don't know if, that, if those thoughts resonate with you at all. I think, you know, fruit has always been part of, you know, in much the same sense, it's been part of colonial legacies. It's always been a, um, an extension of like wealth and grandeur and plenty and excess for sure. Uh, I remember reading this story about pineapples and how pineapples used to be, because they were so rare in Europe, they were rented and then they would be the centerpiece of like your elaborate party. And then people would talk about, oh, you know, so-and-so had a pineapple at their party or something like that. Um, so I think it's it's always sort of um, intrinsic there. Any large displays of food, I would say, is always linked to that. Um, yeah, and I, you know, there's also this uh, culture of like boutique fruits in different parts of Asia as well, where um, uh, you would sort of bid astronomical prices on this beautiful piece of fruit like there's one with the durian that um, and they sell for amazing amazing prices um, and in Japan you can get sort of beautiful uh, musk melons that are just the most perfect thing in the world and it's kind of a, an interesting conflation I think because it sort of goes into this extension of like the more you pay for a piece of fruit the quote-unquote better quality it is and then the more um uh, supposed love in your gifting, you know, so this, um, it can take very sort of everyday and humble roots. And then within the realm of capitalism, it can get brought to a, an extreme for sure. Um, I don't know what like a $10,000 fruit sort of tastes like, but I'm, I'm kind of curious. Um, it obviously brings forth notions of value and wealth um, when you think about it in that context. Um, and I read, obviously, that the works we looked at earlier are still lives, still life photographs, um, but these are also, in a sense, like uh, something you would see historically in a still life painting um, is this table full of fruit and like the, you know, showing off one's wealth and one's um, ability to have these rare objects. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask about um, the genre of still life as kind of a historical genre, is it something that you study and that you're interested in? And do you see um, connections with your work and kind of those, you know, those old Dutch still lifes, for example? I'm a big fan of Dutch still lifes. I just think they're, they're absolutely stunning. And they're, um, even though I know still life in terms of the canon of arts is, is a bit lower on that scale. I just find them more interesting because, um, as opposed to say looking at a portrait and seeing someone's expression 
um, by looking at what they choose to intentionally display as an extension of themselves is, is also quite telling, I think. Um, and of course, from an agricultural perspective, it's also interesting to see things that were, again, available, but also how different fruits have ch changed. I know there's that popular sort of um, conversation about what watermelons used to look like and then what they look like nowadays, just based on evidence um, from still life paintings, for instance. Um, yeah, it tells, looking at someone's sort of, um, like the remnants of their dinner table is quite interesting to see what their personality is like. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you have some other, some other slides there. Um, there are some, yeah, these photographs of your, the fruit that you've come across in different settings. Yeah. Um, so the, the image on the left is a birthday cake. And so what I fa failed to mention from that photo of the peaches, for instance, is that peaches are often a symbol of longevity in um, different Asian cultures. Um, and so for birthday cakes, especially for ones for older individuals, you would often see quite a lot of peaches as an extension of this, of this gesture. There's a lot of um, um, superstition, but also symbolic belief in terms of how things um, are digested. And, you know, the other thing you would eat during your birthday is noodles is because by extension, the long noodles are supposed to symbolize like a long, healthy life kind of a thing. Um, so I just love this, this peach birthday cake. That is um, kind of an extension, a very humorous extension of that, because I feel like that symbol circulates so differently here. Um, especially like as an emoji or something. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, it has a bit more of a sexy connotation. And the photo in the middle is kind of what I mentioned. So this is just a small selection of all the gifts that um, my grandmother received on her birthday. And um, I love the idea of gifting fruit as opposed to, to other things, because again, it's sort of like something um, very, functional, something that is um, very genuine and something that's um, has that subtle message of like, take this and eat it and nourish your body with it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a very visceral thing as well, as opposed to say a card or a, um, a different kind of object. Um, so there's a, a lovely sort of picking experience with um, how that comes about. And the photo on the right is um, before Chinese New Year last year in Toronto. And this is where, um, this is a small shop where I get my bombies from. And so in addition to sort of uh, more personal ways of putting out fruit as an offering, this is, um, this is this particular restaurant's way of doing that a little bit, um, which I just quite liked as, a, as an assortment to see what they would select basically. Yeah, thank you for sharing those with us. Um, Shelley, you have a really massive project that has been unveiled in downtown Hamilton quite recently. Um, I know a lot of people are very excited about it. Um, it's called To What Do We Owe This Honor? And, um, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. It's okay. <laughs> there it is. So this is, um, I, I guess it's safe to say this is the largest work that you've done to date. Um, and I'm wondering um, if you can tell us a bit about how it came to be and a bit about uh, what these objects are in the work. Yeah, so this, this is definitely the largest work I've made quite recently, actually um, in whole. And this is the first work that I made during quarantine as well, which was a unique experience to process everything and then to see what um, could be relevant in our current time. And so um, the invitation for this project came from the McMaster Museum of Art as well from Supercrawl where they sort of change out a different photographic installation for this space every year, I believe. And so I had an opportunity to get to know the city of Hamilton a bit more, which is not a place I'm too familiar with. And Hamilton has a lot of radical roots in various places. Like it's, I believe it's where the eight hour workday was established in Canada, for instance. So prior to that, you know, labor laws were just kind of 
non-existent and people would work forever. Um, and there's also been a, a lot of other sort of historic monumental times in that, in that city. Um, but what sort of struck me about Hamilton is it's, it's got a large range of um, monuments and public art pieces in the city, um, ranging from like war memorials to um, figures. Um, so there's quite a spectrum there. And this conversation around monuments has been quite pressing, I would say lately in terms of assessing who gets permanence in our public spaces. Um, and when I was thinking about this piece, I found out that um, there's a large sculpture of John A. Macdonald in Hamilton, as there are with so many different places across Canada, like there's one just at Queen's Park in Toronto, for instance, that still stands. And so it's been interesting to see as um, everybody sort of tr trying to mobilize for a more equitable world that these sorts of figures still get to claim permanence in our public space, if you will. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in, in this hypocrisy of sort of saying that these are relics from a different time. That's why they're still here, um, even though they still get to circulate without, um, without consequence or re-examination. Um, the idea that a sculpture can sit there for a hundred years and sort of um, supposedly had the same meaning that it did a hundred years ago to what it means now to different communities. And so um, I started to look around my home and look around um, my basement of things in there. And I notice a lot of things that I had that sort of resemble different components of public space, if you will. So there's the Roman column, there's marble rocks, um, there's uh, different kinds of rocks, there's pedestals. Um, and then there's sort of these, uh, these kind of golden reliefs, if you will. And um, and sort of just put them together to sort of see what they would look like as a as a snapshot of like what do we use in public space, what do we allow in public space, um, and by blowing it up to the sort of size that it is for the purpose of this installation, um, it's sort of making a connection between the objects we surround ourselves with and then the objects slash monuments in our cities. So making this connection between the home and public sphere and equating the personal with the public. Um, and I was also reminded of this, this blue figure on the left I had, which is a, um, a food dog or a Chinese lion, if you will. And um, these are commonly seen in like Chinatowns in North America where uh, it would be like the gates where you would see them. And there's normally two of them. There's a, a female one and a male one, though I'm not quite sure how that works exactly. Um, and one of them usually always has the ball under their foot as well, which is intended to be lucky. But they're usually at the gates of like a space or a site or a neighborhood because they're intended to be these protectors and these guardians of the space. Um, for instance, you see them in like courtyards and palaces a lot um, within Asia. And so this past year, um, because of COVID in the sort of conversations around um, COVID being the sort of Asian virus, et cetera, et cetera, all of that thing. Um, within Montreal and within Vancouver, there's been quite a bit of like vandalism for the public um, lions that sort of stand out there. And it's such a, a heinous act to me for so many reasons, but specifically this attack on these public and figures that are, or excuse me, these public sculptures that are intended to be, um, you know, like guardians for safety that someone would sort of vandalize these. Um, and, but on the photo on the right, for instance, this is where a lot of people in the neighborhood got together, um, removed the vandalism, and then also adorned it with amazing flowers as a different way to pay tribute. So sort of the two extremes of um, ways to interact with different things in public space, for instance. Um, this is also a snapshot from Edmonton in Toronto where the lion in Toronto was removed because it was um, taken away for this LRT that's gonna be built there. Uh, supposedly it's gonna be put back once that's, once that's done and completed. And then the photo on the left is from Toronto and this was a, this used to be a, a restaurant sort of building that's, that's been taken over by a development company and still sits empty on Spadina today. 
And so it was vandalized. The other lion um, adjacent to it was is removed, which is very, very bad luck. Um, and so it's also this question of like, what gets to have the safety of being considered public art, for instance, and then what is also considered um, quote unquote decorative. Um, so I think the, even the framing of something as public art and being able to be blessed with the idea that this should exist forever in a public space um, is sort of a conversation that's, that's re-emerging today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's such an important conversation around monuments today. Um, and public art in general, I think, is becoming a field that is much more um, fluid in terms of materiality and temporality. Um, and I'm so glad to see that your, your public piece is kind of reasserting um, your identity and, and your values um, in a way that is kind of beautifully subtle, but also huge, like the scale of it um, is incredibly powerful. Um, and I think the fact that those objects are, are so miniature, um, it brings, it brings um, a sense of almost surreal, like a surreal quality to the work. Um, the, the lion does have this kind of fierce protector um, feel. And um, it is obviously with the sky background, there's also a dreamlike quality to it. So it's, it's so many things. It's not, um, it's not heavy handed, but it is um, very clearly, I think, asserting your position, which is quite beautiful. Um, have you had any feedback from the public on this piece at all? I haven't, and I would love to actually hear a bit more about um, sort of how how it can be seen in dialogue with conversations around monuments in the city, for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and where is it exactly in, in the city of Hamilton? It is, I have the exact street somewhere, but I don't have it in front of me, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, is it the but, McMaster Museum of Art? It's like an extension of that, that space, I believe. So this, this particular banner area is um, a place that McMaster and Supercrop program frequently together, I believe. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly where the address is, but it's in downtown Hamilton is all I know. Nice. Uh, I um, have not seen it in real life, but I will look, look forward to venturing out there. Yeah, I hope you see it on a nice day. Yeah. Um, so you said it will be up for about a year? Yes. Oh, we have uh, somebody commenting James Street North. Oh, perfect. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Shelly, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you tonight. And um, I am always on the lookout for what you're doing next. I don't know if you um, are able to share about any any upcoming projects that you have before we sign out. Um, yeah, I mean, 2021 feels so far away, but it's November now. <laughs> and so there's there's a few things I'm kind of excited about for next year. And it's, it's kind of really grounding to plan ahead and, um, and dream with collaborators and friends. So one project that um, myself and a friend and collaborator of mine named Alvin Long that we're working on is a, a revisit of an older project that we've done called the Red Envelope Project. And so what that project entails is us working alongside um, a number of other artists where we uh, re-envision the traditional Chinese red envelope. And so we're going to, I think we're gonna work with 15 or 14 other folks this year and the idea is to um, create these red envelopes and um, sort of auction or sell them off if you will at price at sort of um, affordable prices and then all the funds raised from this iteration are going to the encampment support network um, this coming year who have been doing really amazing work supporting unhoused communities in Toronto um, so that's going to come out for the next lunar new year which I believe is at the beginning of September and um, yeah, it's it's always really kind of fun to see how people can utilize this medium in a different way. 
And then I have a project that's been going on for a while that's going to be an AKA in Saskatoon. And it's, um, it's a heavier research project looking at um, a few spaces and sites in, in Saskatchewan. Uh, yeah, so that'll, that'll hopefully be sometime in the summer. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I just, you just reminded me that I wanted to make a note that your practice is so wonderfully multidisciplinary. Um, you work in so many different ways with so many different media. And I know a big part of your practice is collaboration. Um, and I wanted to, maybe we can close on this. I wanted to ask you about the work that you're doing with um, Friends of Chinatown Toronto. I know you're also focusing on public space. Um, so if, maybe you could tell us a bit about that group and what you're working on. Yeah, um, so Friends of Chinatown Toronto is a group that's sort of um, separate from my art practice largely, but they're a bunch of amazing community folks and we're organizing around keeping development in our neighborhoods aware of who these developments should be for, essentially. So um, what, is a, what is an actual conscious way to engage with neighborhood in terms of how folks who use that neighborhood are informed of its changes versus, um, uh, you know, approaching it in a very paternalistic or wiping out phase, if you will. Um, Toronto's original Chinatown, for a lot of folks who don't know, is, is where City Hall used to be right now in Toronto. And so that, was, that land was expropriated um, in the name of development um, quite some time ago. And so um, we're trying to keep history from repeating itself in this context, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's super important. And um, we at the AGO are um, on the eastern edge of Chinatown. So uh, it's very important for us to keep um, those efforts in mind and to keep in touch about all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Shelley. It's been a, a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Awesome. Thanks for that.